guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and this video is gonna be my fourth video in my series answering the question, does God require blood sacrifice to forgive sin? In other words, what we're doing is refuting penal substitutionary atonement theory. This is gonna be our first video dealing with New Testament passages, and we're gonna start out by seeing what Jesus had to say about sacrifice. And what we're going to see is that Jesus actually continues the anti-sacrifice theme that we saw in our last video repeated throughout the Psalms and the prophets in the Old Testament. In fact, there are two places in the book of Matthew where Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, where it says in the Septuagint, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew 9, 10 through 13. Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. So Jesus said that loving God and loving our neighbor is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. We take this to mean that loving God and loving our neighbor is the sum of the Ten Commandments. The term, the law and the prophets, was actually the word that they used to refer to the Torah the entire Old Testament scriptures. The law was the five books of Moses and the prophets were the writings of the prophets. So Jesus actually says that loving God and loving your neighbor is the sum of the entire Old Testament text. And that would include everything that's written in it. So that would include the sacrificial system. So love is the sum or the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. It is what God actually wanted and Jesus here is living that out. When he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, what he's saying is that the only sacrifice that God has ever wanted from us is to eat with disreputable sinners. In other words, to take care of the people around us. So Jesus here is living the fulfillment of the law. He is living the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. He is living out the type of sacrifice that God always wanted from us, which is for us to notice and take care of the needs of the people around us. Matthew 12, 1 through 8. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. Verse 7, But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. So what is the sacrifice that God wants from us? to make sure that the hungry are fed. As Jesus says in the parable of the sheep and goats, what determines whether or not we know him is whether or not we feed the hungry, give a drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick and the imprisoned. God cares about how we treat the people around us. Also, in the event that arguably led to Jesus' crucifixion, the overturning of the money changers in the temple, the primary focus of Jesus' anger is against those who were taking advantage of people by making money off of those who were coming to worship. But it's also worth noting that he did set the animals free. So at the very least, we can gather from this that he did not put importance on the sacrificial system that those animals were intended for. Having said this, Jesus does refer to his own death as a sacrifice. In Matthew 26, 28, Mark 14, 24, and Luke 22, 20, we see almost identical wording where Jesus says something like this, This is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. So if Jesus was opposed to the sacrificial system, the idea of shedding innocent blood to cover sin, then what did he mean 
when he referred to his own death as a sacrifice. Revelations 3.18 makes an interesting statement. It talks about the lamb, who is clearly a reference to Jesus Christ, slain from the foundation of the world. And this is what it says in the NIV. The lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. For some reason, probably because 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 says that Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. We have taken Revelations 3.18 to mean that God planned Jesus' death before he created the world. This understanding is reflected in the NLT, which translates it, the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. However, the Greek word translated before in the NLT and from in most other versions should be correctly translated from, not before. Why do I say this? Because in almost every other instance, and there's 482 occurrences of this word in the New Testament, and it is usually translated from, sometimes of, or by. So when Revelations 3.18 says the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, I think it means from, I don't think it means before, just because that's not how the word is usually translated. And I'm not a Bible scholar here. I can't stand here and tell you what that word means. I have to clarify that from time to time, but using the tools that are available to me, looking up the word and its meaning and how it's used and translated in other parts of the Bible tells you a lot. So if Revelations 3.18 is not saying that Jesus' death was planned before the world was created, well, then what is it saying? Jesus himself tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, 34 through 36. Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law, but you will kill some by crucifixion and you will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time, from the murder of righteous Abel to the murder of Zachariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth, this judgment will fall on this very generation. Here, Jesus says that his generation, the one that committed the culmination of all sin, violence against and sacrificing the Son of God will be held accountable for every murder committed since the beginning of the world. Again, in John chapter 8, Jesus told them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me, for you are the children of your father the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. So first, Jesus accuses the religious leaders of not believing him, even though he is clearly from God, he is clearly innocent. Jesus accuses the religious leaders of being children of the devil because he was a murderer from the beginning. They are going to murder the Son of God, and this is the sin that has been being committed from the beginning of time. The lamb has been slain from the beginning of the world because in the beginning when Cain murdered Abel, Cain murdered the son of God. When the ancient Hebrews murdered the prophets, they were murdering the son of God. When any of us in any time or any culture has sacrificed a human, a child, an animal, innocent life of any kind to pay for our own guilt, we have been sacrificing the son of God because we are all sons and daughters of God. This is what Jesus came to show us, that God is our Father, that we are in him and he is in us. We have never been separated from him except in our own minds, and he is in every single one of us. This is what Jesus' sacrifice presents to us. It forces it into our awareness in a way that we cannot continue to ignore. Every time we sacrifice someone, we are sacrificing the Son of God. Every time we abuse someone, we are abusing the Son of God. Every time we mistreat someone in any way, we are mistreating the Son of God. We have been sacrificing the Son of God from the beginning of the world. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve wanted to blame each other for their own sin, we have been blaming and sacrificing the Son of God in our brothers and sisters. We just couldn't see it. 
In order to show us this in a way that we could understand, Jesus came, perfectly expressing the divine nature, filled with the spirit and power of God. He lived out perfect love. He was clearly innocent and everybody knew it. And yet the entire city of Jerusalem, the people that he had healed and taught and fed and ate with, turned against him and demanded his crucifixion. Humanity, blinded by power, greed, and bloodlust, demanded the sacrifice of the one who was clearly the son of God. When the ground shook and the dust settled, the veil in the temple tore and Jesus rose from the dead, we were no longer able to deny what we had been doing. We saw that we had actually crucified God. And yes, I know God can't actually die. I'm making a point here. God is in every single one of us. We have never been separated from him, except in our own minds. We allow our own guilt and our own judgment and our own madness to disconnect us from the reality that we are all one with God and with each other and to demand the sacrifice of each other or the sacrifice of God in each other for our own sins. And the sacrifice of Jesus was meant to open our eyes, to break the power of the cycle of guilt and blame and judgment, which leads us to call for the sacrifice of another. And Christ on the cross invites us into a new way of life, a life that Jesus and the apostles call walking in the spirit, a life lived in awareness of God within us and in our brothers and sisters, a life lived in wholeness and harmony, expressed as justice or love of our neighbor. The author of Hebrews tells us that the sacrifice of Christ abolished the old sacrificial system to establish a new covenant in which instead of offering an endless cycle of senseless sacrifices, shedding the blood of another to somehow pay for the guilt of our own sins, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices in bodies dedicated to do the will of God and with the word of God written on our hearts. This is what Jesus did perfectly, putting an end to the cycle of guilt, blame, and judgment by opening our eyes to what we were actually doing and breaking its bondage over our hearts and minds. And this, the sacrifice of a life lived in love, is what each and every one of us is also called to do. As we continue in this series, we will dive more into the New Testament teachings on the sacrifice of Christ. Don't forget to talk to me in the comments. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.